Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Rice. I am, uh, as it says on the slide, the first vice president of the Airline Pilots Association International. I'm also one of those uh, 747-400 captains. The, uh, as Kit pointed out, the bump in the fuselage is no longer for our wallets, as uh, my carrier has been through bankruptcy. Uh, I also serve in another capacity, and that is uh, throughout the world there are various pilot associations, not unlike ALPA, and in fact there's over 100 of them, and there's an organization that represents those associations. It's called the International Federation of Airline Pilot Associations, and we represent uh, 115,000 plus pilots, and more importantly, just over 100 uh, member associations, which are those pilot organizations. I am the deputy president of that organization also, and as we talk about pilot shortages a little bit today, you're going to hear it's repetitive off of uh, both Kit and Ron's excellent presentations. We're going to hear that the same issues are happening across the world, and I will try to put some of those things in context for you. Full disclosure, however, is always a good thing, and let me tell you that when Kit showed the slide of the very early days of civilian pilots becoming airline pilots at the majors in the late 70s, that was me. In the mid-70s, when the Air Force redid their training plans in the post-Vietnam era, they then withdrew my waiver to become an Air Force pilot and go to the Air Force Academy. So what was I going to do? Because I wore these glasses, and that was going to keep me out of being a professional aviator in those days. Well, I went to one of the schools that Ron just talked about and became a pilot because I wasn't going to take no for an answer. I was stubborn like a lot, a lot of pilots tend to be. And later on, uh, my carrier happened to get sued and, and get, the standards were changed and it was the only carrier available to me actually to get hired. So I got hired, went through this program, and the interesting thing is my son, who wears the same kind of glasses, 30 years, some years later, his waiver for the Air Force Academy was pulled because, as Kit said, there is a limited supply of military pilots. So he went through the same program I went through, and now he is a 450-hour almost graduate here in a few weeks. That will be my big pay raise, because you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it is very expensive. And he's already had three airline interviews, and the answer from the companies that he's interviewed is, well, let us know, give us a call on graduation day, and we'll tell you when you'll start. So it's a very different world out there than it was 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 40 years ago. Aero TV is brought to you by... You've heard of this thing called WAS, right? The Wide Area Augmentation System lets you fly GPS glide path approaches without relying on ground-based landing aids. No VOR, no ILS, no problem. Fact is, WAS is so smart it even knows what you're going to say next time you need it. And don't have it on board. Wah! Wah! I want my watch now! I was really crying there for a second. Let's just begin here, and we'll talk about some of the concerns and the view from the Airline Pilots Association. So let's talk about a, a bit about the pipeline. You know, we, we've talked, and you've heard a little bit this morning, about the historic career path. It was military. The, the great training that was afforded the military pilots in different branches of service, not only in this country, but throughout the world, begat the airline pilot. Civilian pilot training was not done. The way that civilian pilot training has become uh, an accepted way to get to the airlines has been through the university training programs. But looking at it a little closer, what you see is the initial entry-level positions. 30, 35 years ago, you went from that Cessna 172 sitting in the right seat being an instructor to maybe a Cessna 310 flying night checks to then maybe a turboprop like a Beach 99 and then maybe moved across the pedestal in that Beach 99 and started getting your first turbine time and then you went to maybe the right seat of a brand new Cessna Citation 1 and then maybe you got to be an instructor in that airplane or maybe in fact you got to be a captain on that airplane in a, in a charter company and then you went to be an airline pilot and maybe your first airline pilot job was flying an old Convair 340 for a local service carrier. And after you built some time up then, maybe then you went to become an airline pilot at a major airline. 
But what happened when you went to those major network carriers? You started in the back seat. So even the military pilots, the well-qualified transport and, and fighter pilots that came in, even the civilian pilots, the very few that got there, they went to the back seat, the flight engineer seat, and spent years monitoring the other two pilots and learning how an airline worked. What do we have now? Your first job after being a flight instructor for a very limited amount of time in college while you finish your studies is sitting in the front seat, albeit on the right side, of a highly sophisticated twin-engine jet airplane, flying at altitudes you've never experienced, flying at airspeeds you've never experienced. And let's hope that the person in the other seat, the captain, has had those experiences. Aero TV is brought to you by Cirrus aircraft have always been easy to fly. Now they're easier than ever to buy. A complete line of ownership programs gives you everything you need to purchase, trade, finance, lease, insure, and warranty your Cirrus. There's even an ownership program for non-pilots. The Cirrus Access Pilot can teach you how to fly or fly the plane for you. Find out more at www.cirrusdesign.com. Cirrus, for the love of flying. We're all concerned about the shortage. We've talked about a bit about the pipeline. So where is the shortage now? Well, I can tell you there's no shortage at Delta and there's no shortage at Northwest and there's no shortage at United and Continental or FedEx or any place. There are people standing in line, thousands of applications of well-qualified pilots on file there. The shortage is in the right seat of the regional or express industry. The question I have for you is where is the shortage going to be in five years? And maybe five years is not the right number because with the change in retirement age to age 65, we may see that shift a little bit, but the question is still germane. Where is the shortage in three years or seven years or eight years? There's going to be a shortage. We're already seeing the shortage worldwide, and there'll be a shortage here in the United States. And where is it going to be? Because the important part is when it becomes a shortage in the left seat of the express jet airplane. That's when it's going to take that experience out of the cockpit because you'll have to make the assumption at that point that the experience in the right seat is much like it is today. And once you've removed that experience, that's going to be a concern for us. Let's talk about a, a few things that, that Alpha International is looking at specifically. New first officers at express carriers. We are seeing additional line operation experience that is required. It's not a surprise. The in, initial training syllabus that was created was based on a certain experience level. That experience level, in many instances, is not there now. Now, the progressive express carriers, and we've got uh, John here from, from, uh, from American Eagle, are recognizing this and training and changing their training in order to properly educate and prepare these new pilots for their job. But we're not seeing that completely across the board. We're working with a lot of the express carriers through ALPA and through our training committees to modify their syllabuses. But what we also have to do is look at just the way they do their work, the division of duties within a, within a pilot, two-man pilot crew. And in fact, Ron talked about that, that the ability to work as a crew is still somewhat foreign to these pilots. They've been flying single pilot almost their entire career. Some of the aviation universities are doing a very good job of bringing CRM, or crew resource management, into the initial training programs, but until you experience it live and real time, you're not going to get the full benefit of it. So that's a lot of the training that needs to be done. What about for the other guy or gal in the cockpit? What about for the captain? Well, I used to be a training captain at my airline, and when you check out new captains, the first thing a new captain would always say is, oh, man, I'm not going to teach that other guy to fly. That's not my job. That's your job in the training center. I'm just going to go out and be a captain. And I'd say, well, captain, 80% of your job is training the pilots you fly with. That's what is going to be necessary to change the training dynamic for not only new captains at the express carriers, but incumbent captains, and teach them maybe what it is to teach someone else and how best to get attitudes and ideas and standard procedures across that pedestal into the, the person sitting on the other side.